All right, we are now live and waiting for people to uh, start to join in. The numbers are growing. Uh, all right, I'm going to share my screen. Whoever's got a computer that's beeping, feel free to go oh, ahead there. and uh, turn off all their notifications. Pause. I'm pausing my notifications because God knows I'm going to get a lot. Um, and we are going to share a screen in a moment here and get going. Okay. All right. My fellow webinar attendees, can you see the screen okay there? Ah, I'm on the wrong yes. slot. Yes. There we go. All right. Uh, we've got people logging in. We've already got a question. <laughs> Yeah. You've got your first question. I think this was a record, James. This was like 36 seconds. Yes. Thank you, Hansa, for telling us that you can see the screen. Uh, you have earned a Cupid doll. Uh, we will be sending it to your house uh, in a uh, package. All right. We're going to wait just one more minute here uh, as people log in. Um, I'm getting a text message from someone that says, Michael, you look incredibly sexy today. Can you show us what you're wearing? Oh, that's great. <laughs> is that my wife? <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, it is. She and I text quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, guys. There it is. That's what we pay the big bucks for, for this entertainment. Oh, my goodness. Um, all right. It's interesting. So I've got a helicopter flying above my house right now. This seems to be the, the regular thing. Uh, all right. Uh, just a few more minutes. So what we'll do here is we'll uh, we'll get we'll get started and uh, make some introductions as folks start to join. Um, we're excited to be into part six of our webinar series, uh, not because we're excited to all be uh, working from home, but because there's a lot to discuss and things are moving very quickly and changing uh, in our world, and we want to be aware of those things. So. Uh, let me do a quick introduction of uh, some of the folks we're lucky to have here today. The, the theme is getting back to work and how the different cities and states are responding. And we've got uh, a great group of panelists who can give us perspective from all over the U.S. Uh, Hussein Sonara is the Chief Operating Officers of Sapir uh, Management. They have a number of different properties up and down the East Coast. We're delighted to have him here today to share uh, some of their lead from front uh, approach to uh, how they're getting their buildings prepared. Uh, Hussein, thanks for joining us. Thank you, James. Uh, Matt Hickey is director of leasing for Lincoln Property Company. And uh, Matt is gonna share with us uh, what's happening in, in his geo. We actually have three great folks from LPC here today. Uh, Matt, uh, Daniel Younger, and Scott Barbie. And uh, all of them uh, have different perspectives across the portfolio of LPC and can uh, give us a little insight into how they're seeing uh, the get back to work approach. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Very cool. And then, uh, as always, we have Michael Beckerman with us, who, uh, as most of you know from his years modeling, uh, has uh, <laughs> really been at the. I give up. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Uh, oh, and he's, he's showing us some of his goods. Michael, uh, it's always a pleasure to be doing this with you. Uh, James, thanks so much, my friend. Uh, I'm delighted to be back with you for another week. Uh, as I, we were talking about before, that um, these are the most popular webinars that Creek Tech has ever done. And uh, we're, people refer to them as the Creek Tech Open Path webinars. They're really not. They're all open path. It's, it's all your content. Um, and your themes and your presentation. And we're delighted that you allow us to host it for you. And um, it's been great to watch the journey with you as well, James, from the first week that we did this, I don't even remember when, feel so long ago, which was like, holy, uh, what the hell is going on? And then it was like, okay, we, we had Gensler on and we were looking at what it might look like, right? What it could look like. And then we had, you know, some other, great landlords on talking about what they're doing and specifics on properties. And now we're already talking about getting back to work. And I think it's been a great progression and a great evolution. And I'm just really looking forward to today's uh, conversation. So again, thanks for letting us come along for the ride. Uh, look, my pleasure. This is exciting uh, that we get to talk about this with a whole host of different folks. 
Um, so look, the agenda today is pretty basic. Uh, we always uh, do a little bit of a framework overview, set the sort of table, and then we'll have uh, feedback from our various panelists on what they're seeing uh, within their properties uh, across, uh, across the US and talk a little bit about our best practices and recommendations uh, on what we see. So with that, uh, you know, I thought what I would do is uh, set the table a little about what we're kind of seeing in the marketplace. Obviously, uh, certainly COVID is real and we're seeing uh, an incremental, uh, you know, number of people, both uh, in terms of confirmed cases and deaths across the US. Um, and we know where those big clusters are. Obviously, you know, New York's been tremendously affected uh, and uh, we've been able to flatten the curve pretty effectively uh, around the rest of the country. Uh, but we obviously have to be vigilant and part of our get back to work strategy is uh, keeping in mind the fact that we don't yet have a vaccine, we don't yet have immunity, and we need to be very measured in our response. Um, when you look at hospital beds occupied by COVID-19 hospitalizations, the trend is down. So there's been a decrease. And again, that has to do with flattening the curve. That has to do with all the very dramatic um, moves that we've made as a country to shelter in place and to really do our best to uh, you know, reduce the impact of this disease. Now, where you start to see things shifting is now uh, you got 100 million people that can move around again. Uh, public health officials are warning that, you know, this deadly surge might actually follow as we sort of go back to work. So our responsibilities in the commercial real estate space are what do we do to ensure people come back in a very responsible way, that we are giving them the best education and tools to inform them on how to come back and doing so in a way that's consistent with our own integrity and morality, as well as government and, and compliance standards on local and state and uh, federal levels. Uh, we are seeing just from our data that uh, it's still flat. So we are not yet seeing a return to work on the Open Path Network. We have thousands of buildings deployed across the US. Our social distancing index, which is published on our website, shows that uh, there's actually a very, very minor and slow increase nationally in door unlocks. And so clearly uh, people are not yet going back to work. We're still in a planning and preparation phase. Um, you know, the uh, public concern is very real. Uh, this report from Bain uh, is kind of interesting. When you take a look at uh, the financial impact of uh, this, you know, pandemic on our country as compared to the fear and concern people have around actually getting sick, you see that uh, the financial impact is of greater value and importance for the most part than the fear of actual getting infection. And so uh, what's really interesting here is that there is gonna be a surge and a dramatic um, desire across the entire population to get back to work to reinvigorate our economy. And we have to balance that with all the concerns that we all have around our health. Uh, you know, the framework we had set up in the past is this whole different phases, phase one, two, three, and four. We know we're in phase two right now, which is this pre-vaccine phase. And, you know, we're you know doing this emotional dance back and forth between political and emotional, uh, you know, uh, inputs uh, that, that are, you know, facing us today. Uh, the guidelines, of course, the government has already put out, uh, implement social distancing, temperature checks, sanitation, disinfection, and no business travel. Uh, but what we're seeing is that technology and uh, also process is being, being put in place by business owners, by landlords, uh, to make sure that we are doing things like reducing common touch points. Obviously, Open Path can do that with mobile access control, wave your hand to unlock a door. Uh, but you can do the same thing with cleaning stations. You can do the same thing with redesigning, you know, load in and load out in your lobbies. Uh, and a conversation we've had up to now is who's going to pay for all this. Uh, and the, the net result was, wow, well, rent revenue goes down uh, as people don't use as much space or are struggling. Owners are struggling to meet debt covenants. Uh, lenders are reducing their yields. Uh, is this going to shake out in one way, shape, or form? And I think that uh, across the board, what we're seeing is that rents are stabilizing. Uh, what we're seeing is that people are uh, actually intending to go back to work. And all the signs seem very positive, and, and we'll, we'll look to hear from, you know, feedback from our constituents on that channel, uh, later on. Uh, and then there's a whole conversation about what's a good long-term investment and what's a, a, a bad long-term investment, or basically it's just a short-term investment. So uh, one thing I thought I'd put up is this uh, picture. This is what they're doing in China. 
this is their short-term investment for how you deal with elevators, right? Toothpicks. Um, now, uh, we actually, I've seen sort of fancier versions of this that are available for purchase here in the US. Uh, and it's just interesting because yes, uh, you can just basically find something to go press the button with, but you know, if somebody coughs on all those toothpicks, well, that idea didn't work very well, did it? Because now you've got infected toothpicks. But nonetheless, uh, you know, we're all gonna get creative in, in sort of how we deal with this. So rather than me talk the whole time, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Hussein. And what would be great is if you can kind of give us an outline. I've got a couple of slides that you were kind enough to share with us about your approach. How are you approaching this with your, your tenants? Um, and maybe walk us through some of the slides that we've got here in terms of uh, how this is going for you guys. Sure. Um, so we're a New York City based landlord. Uh, we have exposure in commercial office, hospitality, and residential uh, holdings, mainly in Manhattan and in Miami. Uh, some of our more uh, opportuni opportunistic development uh, is happening in Miami and, and our core business office in, in Manhattan. Um, we manage large assets. We own large assets. We have a very diverse tenant roster. And uh, the first outlook on the entire situation from our perspective was one more of philosophically, what do we have to do to ensure that our tenants ultimately get to a place where they feel confident and comfortable coming back into the work environment. And we knew that that burden of responsibility ultimately would fall to us as different uh, guidelines have been issued from the different authorities having jurisdiction. And in New York, we have uh, federal state and municipal, which are completely most of the time in opposition with each other, uh, not really necessarily having given throughout the course of this a clear path. Um, the responsibility has fallen on landlords and, and figuring out what is going to be the best managed approach to handling this. Um, knowing that the customer service element of this cannot be lost amidst uh, draconian uh, measures being implemented. So um, we took the position that it was going to be a bit of a mixed bag approach uh, in the sense that we have to cover multiple bases. Base one is what is the immediate physical, technological, infrastructural implementations that we can put in place? Uh, what are the midterm uh, implementations and what are the long term? A lot of our properties have their own infrastructure uh, impediments to them. So implementing those things takes time. It takes planning. It takes long range. And given global supply chain disruption, nothing is available to happen quickly or easily. So figuring out how do you create a scenario where folks can come back and feel that they are not going to be at risk was the first priority. Um, so in terms of uh, how we initially deployed that, we created a, a tenant-facing document uh, that educated our tenants to what all of the specific approaches we were going to be taking were going to be. So uh, these first couple of slides are just sort of the, you know, the prelate uh, explaining how we see the situation and, and what the challenges are. Uh, and then going into some of the different immediately available utilities and implementations that we are able to put into place while we're planning for that midterm and longer term. Uh, longer term to us is mostly going to evolve and be in the contactless environment. So automation of ingress and egress, uh, elevator modifications and things of this nature. Um, but the practical things today, the biggest uh, challenge is making sure that our tenants understand what is going on in real time and that the amount of communication is not abated, but only increased in the time ramping back up to people getting inside. Uh, I would say that, and, and here sort of outlines a few of the different uh, products and elements that we have chosen to uh, put into our portfolio and install. Uh, everything from the thermal scan checks at entry point to uh, antimicrobial film. And uh, we conducted a very large national and even global uh, data outreach and uh, analysis of what the best cleaning products were going to wind up being to ensure that the environment stay disinfected and can be prophylactically disinfected. Uh, I would say that the biggest single asset uh, as a commercial landlord that we have and that I think any landlord has going forward is their tenants. Um, from our perspective, we have uh, espoused a program that involves bringing our tenants onto our team, making our tenants our teammates. At the end of the day, the amount of personal responsibility that has to be undertaken by all of us as individuals transcends the differentiation between landlord and tenant and, and all of these sorts of things. Everybody is human and everybody is, has the same risk profile attached to them in this moment in time. So having our tenants as our biggest asset to maintain vigilance and then to pass along information to their individual uh, constituents and staff, from our perspective, is the single most important tool that we have 
uh, and being able to achieve some measure of success. Unfortunately, uh, in the circumstances that we find ourselves in, um, dealing with microbe virus pathogen, this is not a typical uh, impediment or enemy that any of us have ever faced before. The only way to eventually get past it is really truly working together. Um, so we've definitely taken that as probably our biggest tool in the arsenal. Um, again, these are various you know, products and items that, that we're implementing across the board. Uh, we have tried to take on a, a substantial amount of the thinking for our folks as well to let them know that you can rely on us as a resource, not just to keep the air conditioning flowing and the hot water running, but you can use us to consult on anything that has to do with modifying your space, keep your costs buffered and, and the impact as low as we can assist by deploying our footprint and our, our reach. Um, and then the other element of it is consistently and constantly reviewing and analyzing what the various guidelines are coming because they're changing daily and trying our best to continue to educate our people to what they need to be looking for because they may not be aware of it. And in most cases, they have not been. So uh, it has been a very highly engaged paradigm uh, and that we believe is gonna pay the biggest dividends, not only in actually um, eliminating risk, but also ensuring that people can maintain trust and confidence that we are operating their built environment and we're doing everything that is not only commercially, commercially but reasonably reasonable to um, implement best practices and, and, and deploy best managed approach. Um, you know, there are consequences to everybody's actions and uh, the constant reminder to everybody, and we have a lot of tenant engagement. We have a lot of tenant Zoom calls. Uh, we conduct town halls with our tenants where we run down everything. We issue bulletins once a week in the run-up. And um, when the first day back comes, the success or the uh, shortfall will hinge on how well everybody works with each other. So we're big uh, fans of that education quotient and ensuring that we are passing that information to people in real time, ensuring that they get it, ensuring that they can you know, spit it back to us and ensuring that they know we're all on the same team. And hopefully someday we get back to somewhere that resembles what the original relationship looked like. But until then, we're all 100% in the same boat. So Hussein, one question that came in is, um, what about uh, basically the uh, asymptomatic super spreaders and um, how you even think about dealing with them. Uh, you have some thoughts on that or is it just, it's just par for the course and we all have to deal with those folks. Yeah, so, you know, listen, epidemiology certainly isn't my uh, forte, but uh, I can tell you that, you know, all of the medical professionals that we've spoken to and that we have in our families and so forth, uh, give a lot of insight into that. And the truth of the matter is, what is unfortunate about this particular pathogen, as you point out, is that there is really no common thread at this point that anybody can pin that we've gotten any guidelines from CDC or, or world health or, or, you know, even the local health authorities. It's, it's, it's day by day. We get more information. And sometimes today's information contradicts yesterday's and next week will contradict today's um, testing is a very complex landscape. We have evaluated a number of different testing protocols from all over the world, spoken to public health experts to try to understand well, what are the tests that we could either acquire and provide to our tenants uh, or recommend to our tenants to go and, and undertake. There are plenty of tenants that are undertaking voluntary testing themselves. But at the end of the day, uh, I don't think that we have the expectation, A, that you will ever be able to fully mitigate any one person having this and being a carrier. It's just going to be the nature of it. Uh, and I think the other side of it is, which is sort of the more long-term perspective uh, and that people don't really remember is that, you know, H1N1 is a virus is the Spanish flu. And that was the last major pandemic in you know, recorded living memory. Uh, and that's more than a century ago. And every year doctors treat the Spanish flu. This is decidedly a different thing, but this is something that I think we all have the expectation is going to be woven into the fabric of our daily existences and lives. We're going to have this yearly uh, until there's a vaccine. And even after there's a vaccine, it's highly unlikely that this gets completely eradicated from the landscape. Um, so a continuation of the differences and protocols and procedures that we are putting in place, we expect to carry forward for a good long time, if not forever. Um, and if not for COVID, for the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And I think more than anything, this circumstance has laid bare, A, how from a civil authority standpoint, we have just not been prepared for this. Uh, individual property owners are going to have to undertake the true lead from the front, 
uh, and business sphere influence in terms of what back best practices are actually going to be. I think it's too big of a problem for any governmental structure to truly ever wrap their hands around uh, and control. It's going to become incumbent upon all of us to ensure that best practices are carried and mandated. And we tell our people all the time, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. We can have great, you know, documents and we can have great discussions, but if we're not on this every day going forward, uh, then we risk everything. So in hey, our, uh, in our James, if I, if I could just ask a quick question of Hussein and, and listen, and as, as somebody that works in New York, um, you know, you, you guys have such a great reputation uh, as a landlord in the city. What, what do you do about though? Um, and you, and I, the plan is great and the communication aspect of it, I love. What do you do though on an individual basis in terms of there's gonna be issues about people's civil liberties and things like that where when people don't wanna comply and you're doing all of this, this wonderful work, great initiative, you've got tenant safety at the forefront, but you can't force people to do it. So what, what's your thought process is quickly around that? Sure. So, uh, you know, very briefly, number one, my general counsel would love that question. So I'll make sure to know that I'll let her know that you asked that question. Um, you know, number one, I think all of us are taking directives first and foremost, it's top down. So whatever the state says, whatever the city says, these are the guidelines. And, you know, we are sort of covered by the umbrella of that. Uh, anything else that we're doing is meant to augment what are implemented guidelines or expected projected guidelines. Uh, in terms of folks who are unwilling to uh, engage and, and be part of the solution and not part of the problem, to use a cliche. Um, we would say that, look, you know, our governor in this state has said one thing, you know, consistently throughout this, which I always refer back to when asked that question. Um, people do not have the right to go and put other people at risk. Everybody has to take a measure of personal responsibility and understand that nobody is gonna escape exposure to this. And more importantly than that, nobody uh, can guarantee that they're not going to expose somebody else and put somebody else at risk. So I think that kind of tracks back to our, uh, our paradigm of engaging with our tenants, making and designating tenant leader representatives within those companies so that they get the information the same as we are cultivating the information and, and curating the information uh, and go and bring that back inside and say, hey, everybody's got to be on this page. Otherwise, it simply won't work. The first moment that we are able to offer latitude is the first moment that I think we and everybody else will offer latitude. But I don't believe that that determination is going to be something that we are going to uh, independently decide. It's going to come from a higher authority. And that authority is what ultimately makes the guidelines that we will follow and augment. And at the end of the day, we have house rules as do all landlords. We operate these assets, we own these assets. There are rules to come into the house. Uh, encroaching on civil liberties is certainly you know, a very, very sensitive topic, uh, not the least of which in New York, it's the most sensitive in New York. But at the end of the day, we are um, standing proud of all of that in this moment. And as the moment hopefully, you know, continues a downward trajectory, and we're able to find ourselves in a place where we can be normal somewhat again, it's the first moment that we will want to go and serve our tenant base and offer them that latitude. Because at the end of the day, they pay us rent, we have covenants, we have legal obligations to each other, uh, and financial obligations to each other. But uh, we are here to serve our tenants. And we want our tenants to feel as though their needs are being accommodated, that their uh, services are still being held intact. But in this particular moment, we are truly relying on everybody to do the right thing. And uh, we will not stop sort of beating that into everybody. Do the right thing by us. You're going to get the right thing uh, from us. And as soon as we can break free, uh, drinks are on us. And that's kind of like, you know, sort of attitude. Yeah, no, I like that approach. Well, let's do this. I want to hear what's going on across the uh, the LPC portfolio. Uh, and so we've got Daniel, uh, Matt, and Scott here. And what uh, I'll let you you three do is kind of, uh, you know, go through. Uh, we've got, you know, a, an overview real quick of LPC in your portfolio. Yeah. And then maybe we'll talk a little bit about what's going on uh, in the different regions. So I'll, I'll hand it to you guys. And uh, uh, maybe sure. we'll... I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kick it off here and then... Uh... I think uh, we'll, we'll each sort of have some individual thoughts based on our geography. Um, but uh, Lincoln, uh, for all of you who aren't familiar, uh, you know, we're a national full service real estate firm and um, we cover the entire country, mostly based in the US, um, one of the largest privately held uh, real estate companies in the country. 
Um, we're a developer, investor, owner, operator, third-party service provider um, in a number of different capacities. Um, and, uh, you know, our clients are everybody from the most institutional clients that you probably know, uh, like household name brands, um, down to mom and pops and, uh, you know, high net worth individuals, um, family offices, et cetera. So we really kind of run the gamut in terms of um, our geography, as well as our uh, sort of our, our ownership profiles. Um, we own property. We also, you know, work alongside uh, these people sometimes. Um, specifically in, in my region, I'm based in Washington, D.C. Um, we, I run our acquisition platform here and also uh, work on the asset management side. So I touch, um, you know, leasing and property management, et cetera. Uh, we manage 44 million square feet across our entire portfolio. We, we lease 15 million square feet. Um, and, you know, uh, we own about uh, half a billion dollars worth of real estate, which covers um, about, uh, I'm drawing a blank, 2.1 million square feet here locally um, that we have an ownership stake in. Um, and I think, you know, the same goes for here. We have institutional clients on, uh, and, and lesser of the institutional clients. That, so there are clients that have very specific thoughts about some of these processes we're talking about. And then there's a lot of clients that look to us for guidance um, just because of our breadth and knowledge. Um, here in D.C., just to talk uh, very specifically about our region, I think that's what uh, Daniel and Matt will do as well. Um, DC is in a little bit of a state of flux, I would call it right now. Um, you're, it, the interesting thing is from a new, from a COVID uh, new case standpoint, we are actually, uh, I live in Fairfax County in Virginia and uh, Fairfax County as well as DC both have higher rates of uh, new case, new cases on a daily basis now than New York City. So just to put it in perspective of where we are in terms of our recovery, uh, versus uh, other parts of the country that are opening up a little bit quicker. Um, the, the challenge here is that we are at the nexus of DC, Maryland, Virginia. Uh, so three state jurisdictions, as well as multiple uh, counties within specifically and within Virginia that have pushed back against the state in terms of uh, the level and the speed at which uh, Virginia is trying to reopen. So, there's a lot of challenges, um, not just logistically, but also legally. And I mean, what are you allowed and what are you, what are you not allowed to do? Um, by way of example, I live in Virginia, but my office is in DC. So who am I supposed to listen to? Um, so we've got, some, we've got some unique challenges here. I think Hussein probably has some of those in the tri-state area as well. Um, uh, as far as um, what we see going on in the market, um, and, and like what tenants are actually thinking about, what people are thinking about going back to work here. Um, we have also surveyed our tenants. Um, and I think, you know, not everybody is as forward as we would probably hope in terms of their, uh, you know, sharing of expectations about coming back. But those who have, um, which is about like 20 to 25% of our portfolio, um, they are focused on a couple things. One, I think some initial wave of people will return to work uh, when, and when I say work, I mean the office, when, when those restrictions are lifted. Um, that's going to be uh, right now that's in D.C., that's June 8th. In uh, Virginia, that is um, March tw uh, May 29th, sorry. And in uh, Maryland, that's an, actually an indefinite order where they haven't uh, sort of opened uh, office space yet or non-essential business. Um, the, I think everyone is also envisioning some sort of phase return. I think that's obviously a theme of whatever everything's going on. And what we're doing, um, which is a little bit different from uh, Hussein's model, what Lincoln is doing is we're actually pushing more of uh, some of these decisions um, uh, towards the tenant. So we're actually trying to do some things at the base building level in terms of ingress, egress, path of travel, cleaning, et cetera, which I'll get into. Um, but we're also 
trying to educate our tenants as much as possible about what they should be doing within their own personal envelope within the building. And I think that's where, um, uh, as a di slightly different approach, Lincoln and, and many of our clients have concerns about infringing on privacy. And so if we push those to the individual companies and not have those at the building level, uh, we're, you know, I think that's where we're going to, where we feel comfortable, but we're also doing good by our uh, tenants and individual uh, uh, members of the buildings. I assume it's different um, when you own the building versus you're the property manager of the building, right? You, you have different kind of obligations. Uh, uh, not necessarily. You know, I, I, I think Lincoln prides itself on the property management front as thinking like an owner. So I mean, I'll just uh, jumping ahead in what I was going to talk about. I mean, I think we do think about sort of like what the value proposition of a lot of these uh, improvements are, uh, not just the practicality of it, but like how much money do I want to spend today um, versus, uh, you know, and, and how, what kind of utility am I going to get out of that spend? Um, we obviously want to make our tenants feel as comfortable as possible, but we don't want to go so over the top that we restrict ourselves from doing something else in the future. Um, things, as Hussein referenced, things are moving so fast. We don't know what uh, is really going to be needed or what the regulations are. So um, we're doing the sort of like highest touch things first, as long as, you know, there's, there's some measure of capital intensity here uh, as far as when we go forward. No, no, I get that. I yep. guess maybe it, it, I'd love to hear. So in the DC area, it sounds like um, maybe people aren't going back as much yet. But uh, I'd like to hear also maybe start on the West Coast from Daniel too. Like, is it different? Like, are people going back to work sooner on different coasts? No, I, I, I generally don't think so. Um, and, and just for everyone's benefit, I, I cover the West Coast. I, I run the finance group on, on the West Coast, which includes offices in, in Seattle, Portland, Northern California, LA, Orange County, and San Diego. I, I sit in Los Angeles. Um, you know, for the most part at the state level and, and the municipal level, most of these cities have not really opened uh, office office work functions. And, and so, you know, essential businesses are, are going into the office and have been for the last two and a half months. Uh, but for the most part, these restrictions really haven't been lifted. The, the two places where we do have a little bit more significant lifting restrictions is in, in Portland and then in Orange County. And even with those recent easings of, of what's kind of required and mandated by the government, um, we, we've still seen people move into the office very slowly. You know, part of it's functional. There's people who have had families at home, kids at home. Now their schools are closed. And so even if the office is available to them, uh, you know, they don't necessarily have the ability to move back in because they don't have a, a caretaker or someone available. And, and so an open office doesn't really mean the same thing to them now that it did three months ago. And then I think there's also that emotional level of it, of, of people you know, not really being ready to go out into public, not being ready to socialize. And in the, in the workspaces that have been built out in, in most of our projects, uh, you know, especially being driven by these high density tech occupiers who have really tried to historically put a lot of bodies into small amounts, amounts of space and incentivize collaboration, incentivize having people together. I think there's a lot of people who are just going to keep writing things out and, and wait, you know, a few months or, or weeks even until they're ready to go back in and actually get back to the office. So, so even where we do have offices that are open, uh, generally it feels like we're, we're still kind of in the, the sub 20% occupancy range across our tenant base. So yeah, we're, we're seeing much of the same in, uh, in the Midwest as well. This is Matt Hickey out of Lincoln's Chicago office. Uh, we cover the Midwest. We have assignments across five different states. And if you look across our portfolio, there's so much variability state to state, city to city, and town to town. Um, you know, for instance, Ohio started reopening their economy in the beginning of May. Missouri started reopening May 4th, but St. Louis County, where our asset is, didn't start reopening until earlier this week. Wisconsin had a safer at home mandate that was set through May 26th, but last week the state Supreme Court overturned that and then Milwaukee County in turn implemented its own stricter rules. And here in Illinois, we have a stay at home order through May 29th. Um, in all four regions of the state are on pace to reopen by that date. But once that date comes and goes, it's a question of how many people are going back to the office. I think the most consistent thing we've seen across the Midwest portfolio is that 
as soon as any kind of shelter in place measures were put into effect, occupancy dropped to about 5% of the, of the typical daytime population. And then if you look at states that already reopened like Ohio, there hasn't been that huge surge in tenants coming back. It's only moved the needle to 10 or 15%. Interesting. And so I launched a poll to all of our uh, listeners, uh, which is basically asking some questions about when all of you plan on going back to work. Uh, and then, you know, what your concerns are around kind of safety, both in terms of, you know, risk of getting ill at work or even on the way to work, <laughs> um, because I know that those are a lot of the kind of concerns. Uh, and so, like, if I, if I think about what everyone's telling me, um, there are a, a couple of interesting sort of themes. Uh, one is that uh, people are... Uh, definitely approaching this thoughtfully and carefully, whether you are a tenant, an occupier, or whether you're a landlord, uh, whether you're a property manager or asset manager. Uh, there is a lot of thought and consideration still given right now, but uh, it would be safe to say that um, maybe not all the buildings from an occupant, uh, occupier perspective and a landlord perspective are ready, uh, but they are getting ready. And certainly, it doesn't sound like the workforce necessarily is ready to go back. Would you say uh, that I'm wrong in that? That you think most uh, of the buildings are actually ready? Most of the occupiers have plans in place? Or are we still in that process where everyone's trying to figure it out? You know, I, I think just speaking to our, our West Coast platform and, and then the tenant base within that, we've now had a, a two and a half month head start on, on getting functionally and operationally ready. And so I think you know, there's a pretty general consensus that, that we can get people back into the office safely within the confines of, of what's required from the government. And we can do it with uh, limited amounts of friction just based on these new operating plans that we put in place, new signage, new hyper communication, um, and all of the kind of operational elements that come along with, with the actual implementation of, of getting the workforce back into office buildings. Uh, I, I just, I don't necessarily see that that people are ready. And, and so I think the capability is there, but, but I think it's going to take a lot longer emotionally for people to get to the point of. I, 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 completely agree with that. That. I think there's a difference in preparedness between the owners and operators of the real estate and the individuals that are coming into those buildings. I think all of our buildings for the most part are in a good position to reopen. Um, but if you look at our tenants, you know, we're pulling them regularly on their back to work plans we're only seeing about a 20% response rate on that. And a lot of those responses are filled with either incomplete information or sentiments of I'm not sure yet. Um, and on top of that, I think at, at the individual level, there's a hurdle to get over emotionally with these people to get them back into densely populated areas. And especially in, in urban centers like Chicago, that's dependent on public transit to get them into those areas. Uh, yeah, New York. And, and James, I would just echo that too. I mean, one of the things that I see every day is this tension between the real estate community, and I don't mean in a bad way, and the, the tenants, right? I think you've really shed light on it. The real estate industry has been way ahead of this, been ready, strategizing, implementing for weeks, right? I think the tenants are slow to kind of understand how they're going to come back but clearly the real estate industry is ready and we're seeing it you know with these great panelists and, 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 and one, other Michael, point one, to add, one, one other point to add that i think is just kind of interesting is that for the most part what i'm seeing the, is that the tenants with the the greatest amount of corporate resources so the big tech companies who have full teams dedicated to their facilities and, and are are very capable in, in terms of putting together plans and, and are probably very ready to actually implement what they're talking about uh, in most cases, they're being given pretty firm corporate direction in the cases of, you know, Facebook or, or large financial institutions who are saying, you know, we're going to take a very slow, you know, multi-phase approach and, and in a lot of cases won't even be back into the office setting until beginning of next year. And so the groups that have the, the best ability to actually functionally implement it, in most cases, aren't pressuring people to get back in the office. And the, the, the companies that are probably most ill-equipped are, are usually the smaller mom and pops who don't have those same uh, abilities, but are, are, are probably more likely to be resuming operations sooner. And, so, I, and I think those, those companies, those smaller companies, you know, we've heard a lot from them, Lincoln has, in terms of like trying to get guidance for what should we be thinking about doing within our space? 
kind of like what you said, Michael, I think, you know, us as real estate owners, we do this every day. We think about our space, you know, path to travel, all those kind of things. These companies, you know, their real estate footprint is just a very small portion of their operating business. Um, so we can give them good guidance and, you know, give them procedures, thoughts on how to remake their space, et cetera, um, you know, that can be helpful in this process. So, you know, one of the things I've seen, um, whether it's, you know, red state, blue state, uh, or um, different uh, climates, right? Uh, there is a different response that we're seeing across the US, right? Um, and so I'm curious, I know like to say, and you guys have properties down in Florida as well. Um, are you seeing, you know, East Coast between New York and, and Florida, there's a lot of similarities, there's a lot of shared folks there. Uh, sure. Is it a very different approach? I mean, listen, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound crass, but uh, I don't know that there were ever any real rules put in place in Florida. Um, and I don't, and I definitely don't think that uh, by and large, the population in the urban centers in Florida has really ever paid attention to any rules. And, and look, you know, to, to take a step back from the business sphere and just kind of look at what the nature of the fabric of our country is. One of the beautiful things about this country is that we are the country of the counterculture. It's what created sort of the best parts of what we enjoy in society today and what we've evolved into. We are all free thinkers and we have tremendous freedoms and people have not been able to sort of overlay the fact that freedoms within society um, are not relevant in the world of the pathogen. Um, and the pathogen does not care what you think or what your political uh, affiliations may be or, or, or anything about what a complex organism like a human being is gonna do other than to just go and populate and, and you know continue to take over the entire landscape so you have unfortunately a, a massive break between it's not necessarily education of people by and large in these different demographics or geographic locations rather so much as it is you see a different government approach where the seriousness is not as embraced in new york one of the benefits of uh, the current landscape at least on, on the governor side of it and whether you know we like him don't like him is irrelevant there's been a lot of really strong communication and leadership uh, shown from the governor's office to at least continue and constantly educate people as to what the truth of the metrics are, what the risks are, and how everybody needs to pay attention to the extent that anybody does pay attention to it. You get a lot of great information and it's not necessarily even rocket science. You can understand it. You can make choices that put you less at risk and more importantly, put the people around you less at risk. Um, Florida, we've not seen that. Uh, we're, of course, taking our own measures within our projects down there to ensure that they are being held to the same standard as we're holding it in New York. New York, and specifically Manhattan, uh, presents a density complexity that there's no other real market segment in the United States that has. So um, in terms of solving those problems, and again, getting people back to a place of confidence that you know there's plenty of chaos in the world and the chaos will be there waiting for you when you leave the front door of the building. But when you come into the building, we've got the chaos under control as best we possibly can. That's kind of been you know on, on our micro level what we've done, but it all does come from the top down. And I think you have begun to see laid bare really uh, the wheels of democracy at work in terms of how different governors are taking different approaches to this. And I don't want to smirch anybody's um, you know leadership in this country everybody's had to sort of figure out what the best practice is but anytime you see a political dimension introduced into a scientific problem you're gonna have major issues of uh, intact communication and valid communication the biggest thing outside of even the real estate is people don't know what to trust as the right information the wrong information the truth the non-truth it's just it's so mixed and it's so cross influenced that it's uh, uh, people have a hard time just getting to the bottom line. And uh, hey, the James, bottom line, you, sorry, sure. sorry, that's, Steve, go ahead. No, no, that's that's it. Just it's 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 just um, you know you see that you see that in front of you, and you uh, try to do the best that you can to make sure the information that we're disseminating, at least, is the correct information that it's been vetted, that it's coming from the right sources. Um, and you know, I think that's not a uniquely New York thing, but definitely something that we have the burden of the hindrances in a very complex urban landscape that we have to deal with. We don't have a lot of margin for error. Right. So, um, you know, we're held to a higher standard here in New York. And again, our standard that we're using in New York, we are deploying within our assets in Florida. 
Hey, James, could I just jump in one quick one for the group? I wanted to know. Is, so one of the things I probably get in trouble for, but what the hell, what, what do I care? Um, it's my show. <laughs> well, it's your, it's open past show. Um, I'm the co-host. Everything's always Michael's show. Thank you very much. Uh, I think one of the things that people are not talking about, which is kind of like a, a little secret that uh, is being whispered, is a lot of tenants have health and wellness first and foremost. I get it and I believe it, but it's also a cost factor of having to retrofit and enhance their individual spaces, right? At a time when whatever the unemployment number is and the economy contracting, a lot of companies just don't have the money to like, let's just go there. So what are you guys like, you're approaching like everybody I'm sure has open path in all their buildings, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, I tried. But you know, you're, what are you, how are you deciding what monies to spend on your common areas like an open path, et cetera, et cetera, elevators, et cetera, et cetera? Because that's got to eat into your CapEx as well. So how are you guys making those decisions? Um, at least speaking for us, uh, I can say that the way that we make these decisions is really always about how to deploy capital for the future for the properties anyway, um, regardless of this, of the pandemic. We're always looking as to how to improve and how to create, you know, more efficient and uh, comfortable uh, tenant experiences within the common areas. In a large part, a lot of the things that we are uh, going to be implementing on our mid and long term plan retrofit to answer this problem are things that we were considering implementing to begin with anyway. Uh, in terms of tenant spaces, um, from our perspective, and, and again, from guidelines offered by the state, every individual business owner has to have their own uh, mitigation plan and business operation plan within their own individual environment. Uh, and to speak to you know, the, the part of this is who's gonna pay for it and if you don't have the capital reserves to do it, the best that we're able to do is offer assistance, offer guidance, leverage our footprint and our uh, buying potential and capacity to help offset and ease that economic burden the best that we can. We're offering that to our tenants where you know, we're not looking to be profiteers on this moment in time. We're looking to try to help everybody get back to work and get to a working environment that can help them conduct business again, create business for themselves again, and be going concerns that of course continue to pay rent. Um, but from a standpoint of CapEx on our side of it, we're always making improvements. We're always looking to see what sort of implementations we can do to create a better user experience. I think a lot of these things sort of overlap each other now, at least in terms of what the practical elements are. Um, and a lot of those decisions were in process to be made. Some of them we've sped up the timeline on. And uh, of course, we've incorporated dozens of new different sorts of implementations and uh, retrofits that we're going to undertake in response to this. So that's sort of how, how we've at least taken the approach to it. And on the LPC side, what do you guys, where's the money come from? Uh, I mean, have you, sorry, so, go ahead. Okay. I, I, I think, uh, you know, it's going to come from, I think it's going to become from both just like from a executional perspective, tenants are going to have to share with uh, landlords and everyone's going to do their part to make sure everyone's following the rules and, you know, landlords will do their part to sort of guide people in the right direction. I think there's going to be large CapEx product projects. Um, I would specifically point at um, HVAC issues related to like indoor air quality, which are going to be probably one of the first, like big, large CapEx items that a lot of landlords might pursue. Um, um, but then there's other ones that, you know, maybe don't make as much capital sense. But on the other side, there's going to be operational day-to-day -day stuff like additional cleaning, um, day porters, uh, you know, that kind of stuff where, uh, you know, that part is going to fall on the tenant as part of uh, OPEX in a, in a recovery method. So, um, or or in the form of a, of a higher rent probably. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think it's gonna be shared, but I, but I think everyone's gonna do their part. And to add to what Scott just said, I think Lincoln nationally and in the Midwest is an excellent maintainer and improver of real estate. So a lot of long-term capital projects that we already had planned or have already completed are paying dividend, dividends now. The building that I'm in, for instance, we just redid all the elevators with uh, like a destination dispatch system. And now we're able to let tenants use their smartphones and fobs to call to their floor so they don't have to touch anything from the point they walk in the building until they get to their space. So um, 
there's a number of questions that are sort of coming in. So let's talk about, um, you know, uh, I know part of the things that people are sort of asking are uh, in these big cities, whether it's New York or San Francisco, um, do you as all developers and managers of property, do you see um, an opportunity to develop new uh, buildings and projects outside of the urban centers? And is this kind of a moment in time where you're like, yeah, maybe it's time we move out of the urban center and, and focus uh, that next dollar of capital, that next uh, day of work on, on stuff that's outside? Or are you equally as committed to you know, urban centers and, and, and those markets? Look, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into it from the Lincoln side and, and speaking to some of the higher density uh, markets that, that we cover within the West Coast, so it's like Seattle, San Francisco being two of probably the highest density areas. I think it's just way too early to say. You know, we're, we're two and a half months into what will probably be a multi-year crisis, and you don't want to be making major capital decisions in the midst of, of something that you really don't have all the facts about. And so we've been long-term investors in, you know, main and main CBD locations. We've also been investors in, in suburban office locations um, historically, and, and we want to be able to pivot and, and allocate capital and allocate resources to the places where the most tenant demand is going to be. But in having these you know, daily conversations with, with some of the, the, the largest tech companies and, and large occupiers who are really driving the growth across, across most of these West Coast markets, I don't think any of them really have an understanding of what's going to happen yet either. And so, uh, well, there, there may be some skepticism towards going into a 40 story building with multiple tenants and having to you know, touch elevator buttons. I, I think there's also uh, you know, an element of the immediacy and, and the emotional factor here. And so down the road, I, I think you know, capital decisions don't get made about going or not going on a development project over the course of days. It, it'll happen through the end of this year and into the next year and, and, and obviously going forward. And so I don't think we're in a position to really be able to say one way or the other. And, and we're definitely not seeing capital completely eject from high density markets, although there's definitely some trepidation about you know, going forward with new investments that were maybe identified pre-COVID. Yeah, you know, we're, we're of the same sort of mindset. Um, the reverberations of what has gone on in the economic dimension of this is too early to tell what is going to be a good bet, a bad bet, or what specific space to be investing in at this moment in time. But I will say, um, you know, we are committed to our portfolio. We've, we're, we're also long-term owners. Uh, we buy and we develop with a, a strong sense of future and long-term. Um, so, you know, first and foremost is the shoring up and uh, uh, capturing of the solutions to the impediments and challenges that we face now, um, ensuring that that platform remains intact and solid and prepared for whatever the future may bring for it. Um, we take the view that the opportunities to come will likely be many and, and diverse. Uh, we play in many different sorts of sides of the business. We, you know, we develop, we own, uh, we buy debt, we finance. So we do a lot of different things. Uh, and how those segments sort of emerge and what the opportunities look like. It's, it's too early to tell. Our focus right now is mainly on ensuring to the best of our ability we can get our tenants back into the building safely uh, and get them back to work. And that's really, you know, our, our view on it immediately. Uh, and the long-range planning comes uh, amidst all of that. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is the polls. Uh, the, we did a poll, and um, I'm kind of surprised, actually, that most people uh, are actually going to be going back to work in the next 30 days. Uh, and um, while there's certainly mixed feelings about whether or not um, you know, you're going to be safe uh, when you go back to work, the uh, majority of people, well, not the majority, but the largest group felt like actually uh, being at work was perhaps more risky than getting to work. Uh, which might also be uh, because if they're driving in their car alone, they're probably not at risk as compared to using public transportation. Um, I just find that super interesting. Uh, not exactly what I expected. I expected people were not going to be going back to work in the next 30 days, that it would be more like, you know, 90 days. Uh, but uh, that's kind of cool to see. Uh, I know from an open patch perspective, uh, last week we saw a huge pivot. Uh, and so we had been basically pretty slow for a couple of weeks as construction and you know TI budgets, all those things are basically on hold. Last week, suddenly everything took off and we've been, uh, <laughs> we've been basically ramping up production up at, at you know, quintuple the pace uh, because uh, the demand is there. So we are seeing that people are moving all over the US and there hasn't been any kind of geographic focus. It's been literally 
all over the US that people are just moving and starting to deploy systems now. So kind of cool. Yeah, to add to that, I think we're seeing an increase in leasing demand in the last seven to 10 days in Chicago as well. Good. Not near the levels they were in say February, but there is an uptick. Well, look, let's get some parting thoughts from the team. Uh, and so uh, why don't we um, do this? Uh, I'd love to get uh, starting with uh, Scott. Uh, final thoughts on where do you think uh, the timing is going to be for uh, most of your 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 constituents? Uh, are you thinking it's going to be in the next month or two, or you think that people are going to hold out? And then we'll sort of go through uh, the rest of the team. Sure. I um, I think that we will start to see people uh, filter back into the office in June. Um, obviously, schools being closed, I think, are going to be a very large hindrance to um, a rapid acceleration of people returning to work. Um, I speak on from that on a personal level as well, but, uh, I think, uh, the summer will be very flexible, um, and slowly people will trickle back in. Um, the optimist in me says that, you know, you'll start to see something close to full capacity, uh, come post labor day. Um, when hopefully, uh, schools go back. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't anticipate uh, any like normalcy before that. Very cool. Uh, all right, Matt, what do you what do you think? I think a lot of the same of what Scott just said. I think in Chicago, as the shelter in place gets lifted at the end of this month, June's going to see a gradual reoccupying. Um, once we hit the fall and people have something to do with their kids, I think a larger percentage of people will be spending some time in the office, but I don't think all those people are going to be spending time in the office together. I think that, you know, tenant populations are probably still going to be low, say 50% or below, but a higher percentage of people will be going into the office periodically. Nice. And uh, Daniel, your thoughts? Yeah, my, my, my view doesn't differ, you know, too far from Scott or Matt. If, if anything, in, in some of the um, probably more, more conservative, uh, functionally conservative municipalities in, in the West Coast, so Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Seattle, I, 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 think, I think it'll take even longer than, you know, through Labor Day. In a lot of cases, I don't feel like there will be a, a true resumption of, of business operations, primarily led by corporate mandates uh, up until, you know, beginning of next year. Same. So um, I think that we're probably going to see in, in the city um, uh, the beginning of the first phases of people getting back by the middle of June uh, into the middle of the summer. I don't think we have the expectation that it's going to be more than 25% uh, in the initial uh, wave of people coming back. Uh, the same as everybody else, it really is led by the individual corporations and the companies and their plans. We've heard from some of our tenants they're not going to come back until, you know, after the 4th of July or, you know, even more towards the end of the summer. Um, but from an open for business standpoint uh, and, and authorities having jurisdiction telling us it's okay to start doing things again, I think we're probably seeing mid-June as the first part of that. Um, we're pretty close to hitting the, the metrics set forth by the governor um, to do that in New York, but it's all going to be about the comfort level. And it's all going to be about how people really, you know, ultimately feel about it. So we fully intend on doing everything that we can until then to get prepared, continue being prepared and be ready for that moment. But I think that, you know, once we have it, the big question after that is not, okay, everybody's back and now how soon until we get back to full capacity. It's really about whether or not we see a resurgence in this and then what the reaction from the authorities having jurisdiction is going to be to a resurgence. I also don't think that it's a question of will we have a resurgence? There undoubtedly will be. Um, do we get locked back down afterwards or does the directive change and we continue to go forward and, and repopulate these locations and sort of just let the situation take its course, which is a total unknown right now, but we're trying to think of it from both ways and be prepared as best as we can. All right, Michael, your final thoughts? Yeah, I, I think the cat's out of the bag, and it's not a question of being an optimist or pessimist. I don't think we're going back to work as we were previously. I, I think it's, I think it, the, you know, the great experiment of people working from home worked. And I think if you spend the more time you spend on the tenant side, uh, you understand what they're talking about is this distributed flex time workforce is here to stay. It's better quality of life, less commuting. It worked. And I think 
I don't think we're going back to full 100% capacity in the workforce as we were for, you know, till the next cycle, which how many years that might be out. I think this is permanent. And um, I don't think it's a bad thing for the real estate industry. I just think they need to be realistic and that the tenants and their expectations and their needs and their desires have changed forever, just like in healthcare and just like in education. There's a paradigm shift that's happening in the way space is occupied and people work. Yeah. Well, look, this is all great commentary. Uh, I appreciate everybody dialing in and listening as always. Um, uh, great questions. Uh, our panelists, thank you for your time today. A great perspective. Uh, love working with you guys on this stuff. And uh, we will see you next week for the next uh, part seven of this series that will never Another end. great one, James. Congratulations, man. Uh, well right. done, as always. Thanks. And thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Bye.